I'm going to introduce uh, best-selling author, Kathy Rikes. Of course, Kathy is one of only 82 board-certified forensic anthropologists in the US, so I am absolutely terrified that she's going to look at all our osteospecimens and tell me all the conditions are wrong. Um, so maybe we'll work on that later on. Um, so without further ado, as I say, I'm going to introduce Kathy Rikes. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Random House for coming up with the brilliant idea of having this event. And I want to thank everyone at the Barts Museum for hosting us. I haven't seen any mistakes yet. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for coming. OK, what we're going to do today is talk about forensic anthropology, which is my science, but how I take my science out of the crime lab and into the form of crime fiction. Some of you may have read a Temperance Brennan book, anyone? Okay, there are a few of you out there. Some of you may have published a Temperance Brennan book. Has anyone caught an episode of Bones? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're about to start our 10th season. We're about to film our 200th episode, so it's kind of hard to avoid us. Has anybody read a Tory Brennan book? Okay, this is the Young Adult series. We're going to have to do a little bit of work on that. But what is central to all of those? is forensic anthropology, and that is my science, my specialty. Forensic anthropology is a form of physical anthropology with a specialty in the human skeleton. And we are involved in what I think of as three phases of activity. The recovery phase, and we do that out in the field, the identification phase, and then the analysis of trauma. And those two activities are done in the lab. Now, recovery follows the discovery of human remains, and that can happen in a number of ways. Hunters, campers, hikers, kids, dogs stumble on remains, stumble on bones, drag them home perhaps, and then a team is sent out to do a proper police protocol recovery. I do not, as Temperance Brennan did in some of her early books, go out on my own and dig up bodies. The second situation in which I might be involved in recovery would be a formal exhumation. There has been a court order or a police request or a family request that a coffin be brought up out of the ground in a cemetery. Here you can see um, I'm doing an uh, exhumation at a cemetery with uh, Michael Bodden, who may be the most high profile forensic pathologist in North America. They give you, when it's an older, and this one was, this one was over 30 years old, they give you a ground plan at the cemetery of where the coffin is supposed to be. In this case, they were stacked in two stacks of three. Our coffin was supposed to be second from the bottom on the left, it turned out to be on the top on the right, I believe. Uh, sometimes it's easier to find them, you have clues that give you an indication <laughs> where the coffin might be. Um, it's always amusing to, uh, to as a, you're, it takes a long time for this process to evolve. And as we're standing around, I always read the tombstones around me, like this one. And I, one of my favorites is, uh, we were doing an exhumation, uh, again, let me think where that was, Ohio, I think. And I looked over and the tombstone next to us said, here lies an atheist all dressed up and nowhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> so once we get the remains back to the lab, these are the primary questions that the forensic anthropologist will address. Are they human? Because often bones are found and they are sent in, the police are called, they are collected, they are sent in, and they turn out for some reason, I get a lot of bear paws when I work in Canada. Bear hunters cut off the paws and leave them behind, and then the local citizenry thinks it's you know, a serial killer who's cutting off the hands and feet or something. So once I decide that those are non-human, then that's pretty much the end of it. Although I have had a few, forensic cases, a few cases of animal bones that did end up to be forensic issues. I had a moose case once where you're allowed to kill one moose, and a poacher had been killing multiple meese, I guess. And um, so I was asked to tie the bones that were found in the woods with the bones in the would-be poacher's freezer. So that was, but usually if it's not human, it's not going to end up in court. How long ago did the individual die? Generally, if it's more than 25, 30 years, it's probably not going to end up in court, although there are always exceptions. Then, once we decide it's human and it's modern, 
who is the individual identification, what was the manner of death, and in some cases, the key question is, what happened to the remains after death? Now, I'm often asked, what is the difference between anthropology and pathology? If a body is fresh, if it's recognizable and a normal autopsy is possible, where they make a Y incision and take out the brains and take out the liver, etc., you've all seen that on TV, uh, that would be for the pathologist. The anthropologist is brought in when the remains are compromised. They are burned or mutilated or mummified or decomposed or perhaps just skeletal. This is the typical case that might come to me. This is actually one of our props. I'm standing on the set of a Bones episode. So if you're squeamish, relax. That is made out of acrylic. But that's the typical kind of case that the anthropologist would work on. And our job is to tease whatever information we can from the bones, from the skeleton. So in a case where we have no idea who it is, positive identifications are usually made with dental records, perhaps with DNA. But you can't use dental records and you can't use DNA in a vacuum. You have to know whose dentist to go to. You have to know whose family to go to for a comparative sample of DNA. So when we get a completely unknown set of remains, I will give the investigating officer what I think of as the biological profile. The gender, the age, the racial background, the height, any individuating characteristics that I can derive from the bones. It always comes down for me to the bones. So gender, um, the most useful parts of the skeleton for gender are the skull and the pelvis. If you look at the upper right, that's the female, oh, sorry, sorry, the up, lower left, that's a female pelvis. The female pelvis has to accomplish things that the male pelvis couldn't dream of <laughs> in a lifetime, and therefore it undergoes certain changes, shape modifications at the time of puberty. The male skull tends to be uh, more robust. Do you notice that little bump at the back, the lower back? That's where the neck muscles attach. That's bigger in the male skull. Um, just generally, it's more robust in shape. The brow ridges above the orbits are bigger in the male skull as compared to the female skull. Those are some, I'm going to be very oversimplistic here, but those are some of the features that I look at. So now that you all know that, you can wander around and look at the skulls that are in here and see if they've uh, established gender properly. <laughs> Age, the younger the individual, the more accurate I can be. Kids are still growing, their teeth are still developing and erupting. So I look at the dentition, the formation of the dentition, as well as the, 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 the completion of the root process. I look at the development of the bones, the length of the long bones. Um, and with kids, you can be pretty accurate. You can give a plus minus of a few years or even a few months. All of that development is finished in the skeleton by about age 25 to 30 at the oldest. Pretty much it's downhill after that. So we have to look at different, we can't look at developmental processes, we have to look at kind of breakdown in the skeleton. Tempe is always talking about the pubic symphysis, that's the point where the two halves of the pelvis meet in front. That's what you're seeing on the lower left there. And the face of that undergoes change throughout adulthood. So I can look at that, I can score it, I can get an age estimate on adults based on that. The ribs, where they attach in front via cartilage to the breastbone, undergo change so that in elderly adults, you're going to see these long, gnarly spicules of bone that you see in the middle slide. And then, of course, the quality of the bone changes as one grows older. It, you, you've all heard of osteoporosis, for example. The bone may become thinner in elderly adults. So given those, I can't be nearly as precise. And with an adult, my age estimate may be plus or five plus or minus five years, 10 years, maybe even 15 years. When I do that, the police look at me and they go, great, that's a really big help. He's between 35 and 50, right on. <laughs> Ancestry is kind of a slippery topic because the whole concept of races is a slippery concept. It's a construct. There is no, no such thing as pure races. But we tend to talk with law enforcement in terms of the big three as we think of them traditionally. People of African ancestry, people of Asian and Native American ancestry, and people of European ancestry. And the areas that are most useful are the shape of the skull and the architecture of the mid-facial region. 
So that's what I would look at to establish broad racial background. So that all has to do with the biological profile. Individuation means I look at the skeleton for any little peculiar or unique characteristics that might be useful in establishing an ID. On the left, you see a lumbar vertebra, one of the lower vertebras, and in some cases, the arch, which is separate uh, early on in development. It just fails to fuse. It, you may not even know you have it. It may not cause any particular problems. But if you can see that, and then you can spot that on an anti-mortem x-ray, that can be a good point of identification. I don't know how well you can see it. That on the upper right, those are the lower end of the thigh bone in back, and there are little round areas of porosity. That's the result of tendonitis. So I can say, well, maybe this person was a runner or did something strenuous with the legs that would have caused tendonitis. On the lower right, that's just a healed, fractured nose. Again, a piece of medical history about the individual that might turn out to be useful. Not one of those will be good for a positive ID, but if you get enough of that, it can contribute. The other area that I look at is trauma or manner of death. Um, blunt instrument trauma, for example, if someone is hit, the, the bone is a, is a phys has, obeys the laws of physics. It's going to fracture in certain ways. And if I can look at the fracture patterning and work back from what caused that, then I can say to the police the number of fractures, uh, which one occurred first. Um, this was a situation in which the, the father and the son got into an argument. The son was schizophrenic. He settled the argument with a two by four. So I can say where the son was standing, where the victim was standing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the right, that's sharp instrument trauma. This was the result of a, a drug deal that went bad. And I can maybe tell the police, because you've got cut marks on adjacent vertebra, well, it was a double-edged knife, for example, and there were this many stab wounds. Gunshot wounds. Um, one of the things I might be able to tell the investigating officer is where the bullet entered, where the bullet exited, what you see in the little inset there. Anytime a bullet goes through bone, as it goes in, it's going to go out in cleanly, but as it exits the bone, it's going to pull bone with it. Little fragments of bone are going to travel along the trajectory with the bullet. So it's beveled, in other words. So if I can see where the entrance point is, if I can see where the exit point is, I can reconstruct where the bullet went in, where the bullet went out, where the victim was standing relative to the shooter, for example, how many bullet holes, what was the sequence of the bullet shots, of the shots, etc. Um, one of the tough things to sort out is anti-mortem versus um, post-mortem trauma. By anti-mortem, I'm using that in a very broad sense. What occurred when the person was alive at the time of death? That would actually be perimortem. And what was post-mortem damage? What you see there is typical of any remains found that have laid outside for any period of time. It's animal scavenging. Those are puncture marks from the, tooth, the teeth of a scavenging animal. So that's post-mortem. That happened after death. It doesn't tell me a thing about what the cause of death was. So what also runs through all of these forms of fiction that I write, I take my science and then I create fiction in the form of Temperance Brennan. And there I put uh, old Sherlock in there because I, was, I learned uh, that when I was coming here that um, Conan Doyle allegedly wrote Scarlet. The, yes, the study in Scarlet right here in this building. So I thought it would be very appropriate to have him appear in our lecture. And the way Temperance Brennan thinks, the way forensic scientists think, is very similar to Sherlock Holmes, one of the original forensic scientists. He says, I never guess. It's a shocking habit. It's destructive to the logical facility. It's all about logic. And of course, Temperance Brennan says, it's not magic. It's a logical recreation of events based on evidence. So I think their thought processes are very different. Oh, excuse me, very similar. OK, the first Temperance Brennan book was called Deja Dead. And this is based on a serial murder case that I worked on in Montreal. It was a case that had some very interesting elements to it. Three women were killed. The first two were fresh bodies. They were found very shortly after their death. So that went to the pathologist. When a suspect was arrested, he admitted to having killed a third woman two years earlier, cut her up, and buried her in five locations. 
So that's the case in which I was involved in analyzing those remains. By the way, the, the headline there, if you don't read French, le psychopath, that means the psychopath. <laughs> So when I got the bones, um, I looked at, we knew who it was. We could establish identity by dental records. So my job was to look at dismemberment marks, cut marks left behind on the bones by the perpetrator in doing the dismemberment. And this was a very unusual pattern of dismemberment. Most of the cases I've looked at, the person has done it with the minimum amount of energy expenditure. Cut off the arms, cut off the legs, and usually it's it's for packaging, so you can put the body into a small container. Um, but in this case, the perpetrator had gone directly into the joints. And here you can see where the thigh bone, the femur, fits right up into that ball and socket joint of the hip. So I told police, police that this person uh, knew their anatomy. They knew what they were doing. They had a skill set, such as um, a butcher or a surgeon. And as it turned out, the perpetrator in this case uh, had been a butcher for a part of his career. So that turned out to be quite telling testimony at the trial. So what I do when I take my science and put it into fiction is I start with a core, a nugget like that. Well, what if there was a dismemberment and what if the pattern of dismemberment led to X, Y, and Z? And then I spin it off into fiction, changing all of the names, the dates, the places, obviously, for legal and ethical reasons. Now, I don't work alone. I'm a member of the forensic science community. And I'm very fortunate that in Montreal, I work at a, a full spectrum crime and medical legal lab. So I have all the different specialists at my disposal there. And they're always, we interact, we form a team, much as Tempe has her team on bones at the Jeffersonian Institution. So what I try to do also in each of the books is bring in different aspects of forensic science. I don't think you want to read just about bones all the time. So I try to bring the different sciences into the stories. Now, the little guy on my left, that's my grandson. He was three. He went to his first day of preschool, and he came home. Do you see his cheek? He's got a bite mark on his cheek. Trust me, it is a jungle out there <laughs> in preschool. So I have a colleague, a forensic dentist at the lab, who does a lot of bite mark analysis. And usually the bite marks he looks at, what, what, what did I say? Usually the bite marks he looks at on, are on the victims of sexual violent assault. But I thought, well, bite mark analysis, that is very interesting. So I'm going to bring that into the story. So in Deja Dead, there's a bite mark found. It's found in a very different medium. It's not found on a person. But I introduce one of the sciences with which forensic anthropology interacts, which is forensic odontology. I don't just work at government labs, however. And what I try to do also is to show in the books the different contexts in which forensic anthropologists work. My second book, Death Du Jour, was based on a case I did for the Catholic Church, for the Archdiocese of, of um, Montreal. A woman was, who died in 1714 had, was nominated for sainthood, uh, canonization. So one of the first steps in that process, if there are remains, is to verify that you have the proper remains. So I was asked to participate in this uh, uh, removal of her remains. They were, she was allegedly buried in an old abandoned church. And we had one day to bring her up out of the ground to make sure that it was, in fact, this individual, and then to rebury her. But that would be an example of working for a private entity, not a government lab. Now what, so I use that as the core idea for death du jour. It changed the century, changed the whole background of the would-be saint, etc., cetera, et cetera. The science I use in that book is forensic entomology, which is the study of insects. Flies will arrive at a body within minutes of it hitting the ground, a dead body, unless access is denied to them. Flies are essentially looking for the same thing um, we are. They're looking for good housing, nice place to raise the kids, grocery store close by. <laughs> and a body is perfect. So the flies will arrive very quickly on a corpse. 
The females will lay their eggs. Those eggs will hatch into larvae, what we lovingly call maggots. Those maggots then go through stages of development, just as our kids do. And then they will abandon the body. They will form little, uh, looks like a little brown football, a pupareal casing. And in there, they're, they do what we hope our kids will do. Their molecules completely reorganize. And then they emerge as adult flies. I have three kids. Um, two of them made it through that cycle beautifully. And then the third kind of got stuck in that pupareal <laughs> uh, casing. Uh, phase. But if you know what species is present on your body, and if you know what stage they're in of the larval stage, then you can predict what we call PMI, post-mortem interval. Let me show you a maggot. These are really pretty good looking guys. <laughs> Maggots have evolved some amazing mechanisms. They actually can breathe through their behinds because when they're feeding on a body, they raise the temperature so high that it it would kill them, so they breathe um, through their back ends. That's just one little tidbit of um, <laughs> maggot science. So we learn a bit about forensic entomology in Death Du Jour. Uh, my fourth book, Fatal Voyage, takes us, takes the readers into another area in which forensic anthropologists function, and that is the area of disaster um, recovery. I am a member of the Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Team Network in the United States. It's a national network of teams that are called in, usually at the request of locals, um, when there are, there's been a disaster with mass fatalities. And they help in recovery and identification of the victims. Usually, um, the most common would be airline disasters, but we had a situation where there was a crematorium operator. This was in my district. I did not work on this, but instead of cremating the bodies, he just stacked them in the back of his property, 300 of them. I guess he thought no one would notice. Um, so that had to be sorted out, and the DMORT team worked on that. Hurricane Katrina, where you had a lot of drownings, you also had a lot of coffins brought up and were floating around. The DMORT teams sorted out that situation. So I spent um, a whole year researching and writing Fatal Voyage. It was published in August of 2011, and ironically, in September of 2011, I ended up going with my DMORT team to Ground Zero, to the Twin Towers disaster, and helping to recover victims of that. One of the things we f I feature in that book is forensic chemistry. Um, Tempe, the story is she's called to help in an airline disaster and she's processing at her station uh, victims of this commercial airline disaster and a body part comes through her station that could not have belonged to anyone on the plane. So where did it come from and where is the rest of it? And so what I use as the science that drives the solution in that is volatile fatty acids which break down according to very, very predictable curves. Uh, as long as you know what the, the temperatures were. You have to have weather uh, information to make that work for you. Another area in which forensic anthropologists are involved is human rights. And I featured this in the book Grave Secrets. A man named Clyde Snow, who sadly just left us this year, started forensic anthropologists working in areas like Guatemala and Argentina back in the 1970s exhuming mass graves, working to get victims of atrocities back to their families. So I went with Clyde in the spring of 2000 to Guatemala, where we exhumed a, gra a mass grave containing 23 women and children, the result of the Civil War um, down there. And it was a very moving experience, because each day the villagers would come down to watch us. And we would look up, and there would be these young women in their traditional Mayan textiles. And then we would look down into the grave, and there would be these same young women with their babies and the remains of those same textiles. There was one woman that would come down every day. She had four daughters and nine grandchildren in the pit we were digging. So I use that as the basis for grave secrets. And then, of course, Tempe gets involved in a local murder in Guatemala City as well. Another area in which I've worked as a forensic anthropologist is as an advisor, a consultant to the military, the United States military. We have, our, uh, we have a pledge to our service personnel that if we send you off somewhere, we will bring you home. 
So we have um, a very active program of recovering the remains of dead service persons, bringing them back to a central identification laboratory in Hawaii and getting them identified and back to their families. A lot of what's being done is the result of the war in uh, Southeast Asia, but also remains from Korea and from World War II are still being repatriated and identified. Anytime a positive ID is made, that has to be approved by an external civilian reviewer, among others. So I functioned in that capacity for several years. The other role of that uh, consultant is to go to Hawaii and to o oversee what's going on and to interact with the, um, it's probably the largest employer of forensic anthropologists in the world. I think there are 40 full-time anthropologists out there now. So it would be a really tough sell to my department chair at the university that really I have to go to Hawaii in January. I, you know, I, I'd rather not, but I really have to go. So Spider Bones draws on that experience and Tempe is asked to consult on a case for the military out in Honolulu. My other experience more recently with the military was, was quite a moving uh, one. Uh, I was honored uh, to, in 2012 to go to Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan as part of a USO. It was a joint um, project with the USO and um, the Pentagon and the International, International Thriller Writers. So five of us went. Um, it was um, Andrew Peterson, uh, Clive Cussler, if you're working from left to right, is Clive Cussler, uh, that's me, um, Mark Bowden, who wrote Black Hawk Down, and Sandra Brown. So the five of us went there. We spent a lot of time flying around in Black Hawk helicopters, which when you're sitting next to Mark Bowden, who of course wrote Black Hawk Down, <laughs> is a little unsettling. And we, out, out, out to forward operating bases, we spent a lot of time thanking the troops, and they spent all their time thanking us for coming. So um, I decided to incorporate that into a Temperance Brennan book. So in, our, in Bones of the Lost, um, which is last year's book, our heroine does go to Afghanistan. You know, I never noticed till I was just looking at this picture, first of all, how short I am. <laughs> and second of all, they gave me a helmet. I stand out like a sore thumb. I, I'm not sure what, what the purpose was in that, but anyway. We're wearing 40 pounds of body armor. It was, yeah, that was not my favorite part. But I also brought a case into that, which is the principles here are basic physics. I forgot to make a forensic physics. I don't think there is one. But uh, in the story, someone, a civilian, an Afghan civilian has been shot. A US Marine has been charged with murder. The Marine claims that the Afghan was running at him, threatening him, so he shot him. The locals claim the Afghan was running away. So he shot him in the back. So the case came down to, did the bullet go in the front and enter the back, exit the back, or did it enter the back and exit the front? This is a case I did several years ago addressing that exact same question. So I used that case, of course, changed the whole context and used that in the story. Okay, a little bit about Bones. Um, you've seen a few episodes. The premise is kind of fun. Here we have Seeley Booth and Temperance Brennan. Um, Basic premise is that Temperance Brennan and her squints, as he calls them, are scientists. They are forensic uh, entomologists. We have Jack Hodgins, who's our kind of bug and slime guy. And we have Andrea, uh, yeah, Andrea, who's our, our computer graphics expert, etc. They insist on logic and hypothesis formation and testing and never speculating. On the other hand, we have Seely Booth. He's the classic cop. He believes in gut instinct and intuition and good old-fashioned legwork. So this gives the show the basis for conflict between the characters and also, hopefully, humor. What I do as a producer on the show, uh, initially when we were building our sets, I was asked for my opinion on authenticity. There you can see the forensic platform, which is under construction. You can see Tempe's wonderful. She has these floor-to-ceiling storage facilities, and all of her cases are in there with, with backlighting, and the bones kind of glow through. This is my actual facility, <laughs> my storage facility at the lab. So we do take a few liberties with reality. <laughs> But uh, my main job is to work with the writers and to make sure that the science stays honest, to answer any questions they might have about the science, to give them ideas that might be useful in crafting stories in which science drives the solution. 
Our props are pretty amazing. You saw the earlier one. These are all made out of acrylic. I think our, our prop guys are, are fantastic at how they come up with detail. Um, we get a little more attached to some than to others. This is the lady in the lake. This was actually from our pilot. Those are our two executive producers. And then the lady in the lake, I'm on the far right. The lady in the lake is, is to my left. The Witch in the Wardrobe is an episode that I wrote for the show that appeared in season five. I do sometimes write episodes, um, and it's very different from writing a novel. One of the things that's different is that you do it collectively at least in the initial stages. You go into the writer's room. You've probably read about the writer's room where they really exist. And we have a staff of full-time writers. And you go into the writer's room, and um, initially you have these terrifyingly blank, empty boards on the wall. And together, you can spend anywhere from a week to three weeks, you hammer out your storyline, your A story, your B story, your C story, so that by the end of the week, you've got a full outline of your episode. Another thing that's different is that you have a lot of bosses in, in bo uh, television. You have to answer to the executive producers and the network, et cetera, the studio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So once you're sent home, you've pitched your idea, which is what I'm doing here. Once it's approved, you're sent home and you write the script. And then you might find that a lot of the script has been changed. For example, I wrote an episode, co-wrote it with my daughter for last season, called The Dude and the Dam. And we have this wonderful opening scene. You know, each of our shows begins with, with the, the opening scene where there's a messed up body that's discovered and somebody finds it and everybody goes, eh. Um, so we were going to have our opening scene be an ATV, an all-terrain vehicle driver. He's screaming along. He hits something. He goes airborne. He goes crashing. And he lands in a puddle of slime which has been created by leopard slugs. Leopard slugs are fantastic. They can make this slime, and water, when water's added to it, it increases his volume something like 99 times. So we thought, that's great. And he'll go in this puddle of slime, and he found a body. That got changed to um, two kids walking by a beaver dam. <laughs> and they find a body woven into the beaver dam. Why? Budget. You don't have to crash an ATV, you don't have to pay a stunt driver, etc., etc. And what we didn't know, I'll tell you a secret, what we didn't know is that there were only three working beavers in LA, and right until the last minute, and they were all booked. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? So right until the last minute, uh, didn't, we didn't know if we'd get our beaver. <laughs> but fortunately, there was a cancellation, I guess. <laughs> So we got our beaver, and we were told the beaver was a bolter, that as soon as the, you have to have a wrangler. Anytime you have any animals, you have to have a wrangler on set. So we had a slug wrangler, and we had a beaver wrangler. So we were told as soon as the wrangler opened the cage, this beaver would take off, it would bolt. So we're all kind of standing around, everybody's standing around, because you don't want to lose the beaver. And they, well, it turned out it was a very elderly beaver. <laughs> So the beaver really didn't do much of anything. So the opening scene is a tight close-up on this beaver. And the only reason it's moving at all is we're kind of standing around it with carrots, you know, <laughs> egging her on. I also appeared in one episode. I appeared in uh, season two in an episode called the Judas, Judas on a Pole. I'm sure you all saw that, right? It's probably been nominated for an Emmy or something over here, hasn't it? Um, so there you see TJ, TJ Tyne, who plays uh, Jack Hodgins um, doing my makeup, and I was directed by David Duchovny. Yeah. Initially, when our executive producer said, I'm going to write a part for you in an episode, I said, no, I'm not, nah, that's not me. I'm not an on-camera kind of gal. And he said, well, let me write it. If you don't want to do it, I'll cast it. I said, that's fine, but I'm, I'm not going to do it. And he said, well, David Duchovny's directing. I said, I'm there. <laughs> so so uh, I got to appear with, uh, be directed by David Duchovny which was a lot of fun. OK, Monday morning, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my seventh book, because this is important for the new book. This is based on a case in Montreal. There's an old building, and I'm going to make up names here, not give you the real names. There's an old building in which a pizza by the slice joint is located. So the owner of the building is a French Canadian named Gervais. And the pizza by the slice joint is run by a man named Saeed. So Mr. Saeed has a problem with the toilet, so he calls a plumber. The plumber's name is Wong, Mr. Wong. This is true. That part, the ethnicities are true. So Mr. Wong comes to see what's Wong with the toilet. 
and he discovers a trap door in the bathroom and for whatever reason he opens it. He goes down into the basement and he finds a bone. As it turns out, he finds a big honking bone. It's a human femur. So he takes this bone upstairs to Mr. Saeed and together they call Mr. Gervais and he rushes over. So the three of them, this little international community, take the bone to the library and they look it up in an artist's illustrated book of anatomy. They decide it's human, they call the police, the police go down, they find more, it ends up in my lab. So when I sorted through all of it, I determined that there were three people represented by these bones. So that gave me the idea of a body discovered in the basement of a pizza parlor. Now the key question in the real case was, well, how long were they down there? Was the building built over an old unmarked cemetery? Was it built over an old Native American burial ground? Or were they recent? Were they recent homicide victims? So it was resolved in the real case with a special kind of carbon-14 uh, testing called bomb carbon-14. Between, during the period, between the early 50s and maybe 1963, when there was atmospheric nuclear, uh, thermonuclear testing, there was this special kind, I'm going to be real simple here, special kind of uh, carbon-14 created, and it was incorporated into all living things during that period. So if you can test for that in bone, you can pretty much determine if someone was born before or after the early 1960s. So in the real case, the bones turned out to be old. They were not recent. But again, in the book case, they turn out to be true in Monday morning. So we have these recent victims discovered under this pizza parlor, and that leads to a very nasty situation in Montreal. It also leads to the only case in which is solved, but the only case in which the villain gets away. So we move forward 10 years to the new book, Bones Never Lie. Tempe is asked to come into a um, unscheduled meeting of the cold case unit, the cold case homicide unit in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live. And there she meets a detective, a cold case detective from Vermont. And this cold case detective has done some vicaps, violent criminal apprehension, some profiling of a young girl that was murdered years ago in his jurisdiction. And he's never given up on solving this case. And he has found through doing a VICAP profile that there are many similarities to a cold case homicide of a young girl in Charlotte, North Carolina. Similarities involving where the body was left, involving how the body was positioned, for example. So they have asked Tempe to come to this meeting because they think the two cases are related and also they think the perpetrator is the villain that got away 10 years earlier from Monday morning. That's about all I'm going to tell you. The story moves from Charlotte, North Carolina, to Costa Rica, to Montreal. And one of the things that's featured is something that occurred following the death of Alexander the Great. This is a painting by Van Pilotti, I think it's pronounced. Um, Alexander the Great's body was treated in a very unusual way following his death, because they had to get him from one location to another and embalming wasn't an option. A body is found in this story, which is treated in a very similar and unusual way. I hope the critics will be kind, <laughs> kinder than this guy who was when he read Spider Bones. That's one of my grandsons. I had no grandchildren. And then like three years ago, all, I have five. I now have five, they're all over the place. <laughs> The next, uh, the fifth in the viral series, which is the Tori Brennan series. Tori Brennan is Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece. She and her friends, who are three boys, they're all aged like 14 through 17, are science geeks. They're not the cool kids at school. They use science to solve mysteries and cold cases. These books are set in Charleston, South Carolina. We learn in the first book that something unusual happens to them. They rescue a puppy. And what they don't know is that the puppy was the subject of illegal experimentation with parvovirus. And in these illegal experiments, attempts to weaponize the parvovirus, the DNA of the virus is altered. Normally it cannot transfer to humans, but now it can. The kids catch it, they recover, but when they recover, they notice they've been altered. Their DNA 
has been altered by the parvovirus DNA. They can see beyond what the human eye can see. They can hear like a wolf. They can smell if you're lying or if you're afraid. So what they do is they combine these super sensory perception capabilities with their love of science to solve cold cases. So that's Tori Brennan and Terminal, the next in that series. The fifth in that series will be out in March. I have one last slide to show you. It really doesn't have anything to do with forensic science, but it's, it's my pride and joy. Thank you. <laughs> that was pretty cheesy. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all I have.